3, <clears throat> Psalm 73. Well, it's great to be saved. Amen. It sure is. Good to be in the service of the King. Amen. And uh, it's good to have you folks here tonight. And again, I'll just want to amen and everything as Kelly and Brother Richard said about the banquet. Uh, it's just so important. And uh, if, you, uh, if you really want to go, I mean, you just want to go and you're burdened to go and you'd like to go, and the only thing that's keeping you from going is the price of a ticket, you, tell, you see me and we'll get you there, okay? So, I mean, it's more important uh, to me to have you there than, uh, than to have you to, to stay home because you could not afford a ticket. So if you... If you want to be there, and that is the reason you can't come, uh, you see me, and <clears throat> I'll borrow some money from Kelly, <laughs> and uh, well, we'll get some, okay? Somewhere, we'll get it. We'll shake some of these teenagers by their heels and get some cash out of them. No? <laughs> you don't have any money? Oh, come on, you guys. I know you guys. You got money. All right. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul, uh, among others in the Bible, warns us about the deceitfulness of riches. Uh, it's so easy to get sidetracked. I mean, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world is to get sidetracked somewhere back there. And you, most of the time you don't know it is happening, or you may, may think about it, but you get sidetracked, and the first thing you know, you're too far down the road. And, um, and sometimes it's, it's very expensive. But here in Psalm 73, we see the deceitfulness of riches. And uh, here is a man of God, a believer like yourself. And uh, he, um, he had a problem, and now he confesses it, and he explains how, it, uh, how the problem started and uh, the nature of the problem, and then how he got the problem solved. He said, uh, first of all, notice the, in verses 1 through 3 that the problem is stated. Now, he, uh, he's very confident in verse 1. He said, truly God is good to Israel, and even to such as are of a clean heart. And it is possible to... Uh, to know that, that God is good and that God rewards uh, the right behavior. And uh, this man did not get sidetracked because he questioned necessarily the goodness of God. He got sidetracked because he got his eyes away from God. If you had confronted him in this state, I think he still would have... Uh, testified to the goodness of God because in verse 2 and 3 he makes a confession to that uh, uh, about his own problem and he says but as for me my feet were almost gone my steps had well nigh slipped and he says the reason for that was the he was envious uh, at the prosperity of the wicked he said, for I was envious at the foolish and I, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So here is a fellow that is writing the psalm after he's got his heart right with God. And then he thinks about the problem and he is certain right up front is going to say God is good. And, uh, but here's what happened. And so he's not blaming God as he had blamed God. And uh, in verse 2, he talks about some serious uh, consequences of his doubt because he said in verse 2, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. So the, the psalmist talks about the serious consequences of doubt and the consequences were walking down the wrong path and walking on slippery ground. And that is what happens when we start uh, uh, envying 
the wicked and the prosperous. In verse 3, he talks about the cause of his doubt. He said, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And in most cases, in most cases, unsaved people uh, live materially a lot better than you do. You take, for instance, Brother Arnston tonight. He talked about giving 30%. I don't know what Brother Arnston makes. I don't really care, but I know he's an engineer. And, uh, you know, if he made less than two or 300000 I'd be surprised. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, but I know that he's not on poverty roll when it comes to income. And if you want to look at it humanly speaking, if he's giving 30% of his income, uh, that man could be driving a brand new luxury car with what he puts in the offering here in this church. Now, you think about that. He could be driving a brand new luxury car with what? With the money he's putting in your church. Okay. He probably gives enough here to make close to his, uh, or at least a half, I don't know, of a house payment. But think about the material things. He could be making a payment on a motor home or a camper or a boat. And I'm not saying any of those things are bad. That's not my point. That is not the point. But I'm just simply saying that those of us who give and sacrifice, common sense tells us that that's still money, and we could be having and buying some of those things that we see go down the road or some of those things that unsaved people or backslidden Christians uh, try to enjoy. And that's what the psalmist is saying. He said the, the seriousness of the consequences of his doubt in verse 2 is he said, as for me, my feet were almost gone. He said, I, as Mrs. Bartlett said, you know, uh, when she backslid there, she would think she's lost. Well, we thank God that, that we know better than that because we'd be, all be lost about once a week or more often. But uh, it is possible for a Christian to, to kind of get to uh, his feet going off in the wrong ways because the way you look is usually the way you walk. And so he began to look at this and talks about the significant cause of it in verse 3, for I was envious. And the Bible said, who can stand before envy? And you can't. I um, saw a sign today on a church over here on 164th coming from the freeway, that little ch the church off to the left. We stopped at the traffic light there and I noticed their reader board and it said covetousness is counting other people's blessings. And that's usually what happens. We start counting other people's blessings and they always appear more than your own. And that's what this man was doing. He began to count the blessings of other people in verse 3, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So his problem is stated. He said the problem was I got my eyes on other people and their prosperity. And as a result of that, I was heading down the wrong road and standing in slippery places, spiritually speaking. You've been there. I've seen many folks there. It's easy to get there. In verses 4 through 16, he studies this problem. And the more he studies it, the more complex it becomes. Because as he looks at it, it appears that these people don't have problems. If you look at verse 4, he said, For there are no bands in their death, in verse 4, but their strength is firm. Verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covers them as a garment. And so it seems when you start losing uh, the, the, the spirit of thankfulness for what you have, and you start envying other people, then it appears 
that nobody has as many problems as you do. Your problems are magnified, they apparent, appear to be compound, and the problems of others seem to almost be nil. I mean, they, it just looks like they got their act together. And so the complexity of this problem was the seeming blessings of the ungodly. It appeared that way, but things are not always the way they appear. I, uh, I think about Scott Gregson. I, I love Scott Gregson. He is a good man. And when it comes to being a Christian, he is a, he is a good Christian. The fellow's got about five or six kids. I don't know. I've lost track. I, don't, I honestly don't know how many they've got, six or seven. <laughs> What's that? I'd probably, probably lost track. Scott Gregson... Uh, he works day and night. He works at a job trying to feed his family, and then he's tried to start a printing ministry, and he works all night. In fact, many nights he'll work all night. He'll drive over here to deliver stuff, and he's got a family and got a church. He tries to lead the choir in the church. And, uh, <clears throat> and I've, I've seen him many times when materially they didn't have very much. But I've never seen him complain. He is happy. The guy is happy just like he had a had million dollars. So I don't ever want to pinch him and wake him up. Leave him alone. You know, the Bible says that uh, godliness uh, and contentment is, with contentment is great gain. And so when he looked at, when the psalmist looked at the world and looked at his own problem in comparison, he thought it was a problem. He thought he had a problem. And when he compared them, uh, it brought added misery to his life, as it always will. Look at verse 6, where he talks about the sinful behavior of this crowd. Therefore pride compassed them as with a chain. That is, uh, a rich man would wear fine jewelry. And they would wear sometimes gold chains with, you know, with medallions, etc. Signs of, of wealth and, and prosperity. So what he says here is that the wicked that he envied, that he uh, uh, envied, and uh, verse 7 it says, Pride compass of them like a chain, like, a, like something to be proud of. Uh, uh, it appeared that they had their act together. They have more than the heart could wish. You know, the thing that will really ruin your Christian life is watching the rich and the famous on television. I mean, you watch that a few times. You're going to pull up in the driveway of your little old two-bedroom, one-bathroom house. Huh? You pull up in the front of that thing, and you've just got through watching somebody with 37 bedrooms, 14 bathrooms, gold faucets on 100 sinks, you know. And you think maybe you're living in one of the little pig shacks, you know. You understand? The best way to become dissatisfied with what God is doing in your life is to become envious of others. Right, right. It'll destroy your peace. The best thing to do is just not pay any attention to it if you can. If you'll notice also it appeared that they are solid in their benefits. Look at verse 7. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. That's quite a description of being so fat your eyes bulge out. But that's what he said. He said, their, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. And that's what happens again. You see, you lose complete perspective of reality and values. What's real and what is, what is valuable. And then, of course, in, to, to add to the, the problem... These men insulted God, and they could get away with it. Notice what he says in verse 8. He said, they are corrupt, they speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak lawfully, they set their mouth against the heaven, and their tongue walketh through the earth. They're about as ungodly as you can get. They blaspheme God, they use profanity, they talk filthy, they have no scruples, they are crooked, they connive, and they got everything you could ever want. And he said, here I've tried to live for the Lord and I can't even keep gas in my car. That's enough to create envy. 
It's enough to wonder. Does it really pay off to live for God? And then, compounding the perplexity, look at verse 10, if you would. Look what the wicked said in verse 10. Therefore his people returneth hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. They say, verse 11, how doth God know? They, they are, as for all practical purposes, they're atheists. Is there knowledge in the Most High? I mean, this is an insult. This guy is looking, uh, he's looking toward heaven and saying, hey, anybody up there? And, he, and he's, uh, he's defying God. They're defying God, yet they prosper, verse 11. And they say, how doth God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Verse 11, and they said, how doth God know? Look at verse 12. Here's what the writer said about them. These are the ungodly. You ought to underline this. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. And for all practical purposes, I can tell you that's usually what's going to happen in the world in which you and I live. Right. The, 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 the godly are not going to become more financial, financially prosperous in most cases. But the wicked will. Wicked businessmen, wicked government leaders, wicked anybody in most cases. In most cases. Now look at his confession, if you will, in verse 12. Um... He warns against the seriousness of thinking like the wicked because that's what happens eventually. You watch them. You compare that to your own situation. You say, hey, it, this, this thing of living for God. The preacher said if I tithe, I'd be better off. I've been tithing for a year, and we're deeper in the hole than we were when we started. Preacher said if I'd live for the Lord, you know, uh, things would be better. Things aren't better. My kid just wrecked the car. My wife's got the flu. And I can't even borrow any money. And so you begin to look at the guys you work with, or the late women you work with, and you look at others, you look at the situation, you look at your own, and then you begin to think like the wicked. You begin to, you begin to scheme, you begin to plot. Well, I know how I could get a little bit more. I could hold my tithe back. I mean, isn't that where we would start? That's where we start. You're not going to start with your groceries. You're not going to start with your gas or your phone or your television. You're not going to start there. You're not going to start with Sears or Montgomery and Ward or Nordstrom or the Bond or McDonald's. That's not where you're going to start. You know where you're going to start? You're going to start cutting with your tithe. That's what's going to happen. You're going to start cutting God out in that area. That's, I know how human nature operates. See? Oh, I got eternal security. I don't have to tithe. <laughs> See? And so what happens is we get in this serious debate of thinking like the wicked when we become envious. And look what happens in verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world and increase with riches. If you'll notice in verse four, ver uh, 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain. You see it? That's the conclusion he came to. I've cleansed my heart in vain. I mean, I got my act together, and what is, what's, what's the value? What good is it? I've been going to that church, you know, for years and years and years. We're not any better off materially than we were when we started. That's not true of most people. But there will be, there'll be some that that will be their attitude, and especially when you start comparing yourself to the world. You'll always lose. Because the dev, this world... For all practical purposes, it belongs to the devil, and the system belongs to the devil, and he's going to take care of his kids as much for a while. Notice again in verse, 50, verse 14, For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. You know, your boss won't get off of your back. You get a flat tire. The toilet gets plugged. The kids get the flu. Look at verse 13 and 14. For verily I have, cleansed, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. I just never win. That's what, he, that's what the guy is saying. 
And then the consequences of this kind of thinking is in verse 16. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. It's more than I can bear. So you can understand how the man said my feet were well nigh slipped. My steps were almost gone. I was headed down a slippery path of no return. Why? Because I was envious at the prosperity of the wicked. And who can stand before envy? Now the problem is solved in verse 17. Until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. Now when he went into the sanctuary in the Bible days, when he went into the sanctuary, he heard from God. He went into the temple and God would, would either give a vision or God audibly spoke to him like he would to David and some of the prophets. And so basically what he's saying is he put himself in a place to where he began to hear the word of God. And he said, when I heard the word of God, some things began to happen and I, the problem, first thing is he saw his own foolishness. In verse 17, notice he says, how could I be so blind? Look at verse 17. Until I went into the, into the sanctuary of the Lord, then understood I therein. And I began to understand, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Notice how the psalm starts out. It starts out that he is in slippery places, but he's in a slippery place for a different reason. He's in one because he got backslidden, got his eyes on the world, and became envious, and so he stepped into their position. But the psalmist says, the Lord has put them in slippery places. In verse 18, for thou didst set them in slippery places, thou uh, uh, castest them down into destruction. He wonders how he could be so blind. Verse 18, as a dream when one awakens, so, O Lord, when thou awakened, thou shalt despise their image. You know what a Christian needs, has to understand is the world has the best they are ever going to have right now. Don't you realize that? The world's got the best they're going to have. And uh, when they die, they're going to die. And uh, everything that, uh, every material possession that you and I have or the world has is we're going to lose little by little. Little by little as you get older, you're going to start losing your possessions and you're going to wind up in a little room somewhere with a little handful of old junk. And then when you die, they're going to put you in a box and take you off somewhere, and the kids are going to come around and haul some of that junk off to the Goodwill store, the second-hand store, and a few buttons and trinkets will be kept for the kids and the grandkids, and that's just the way it works. A fellow said uh, he died the other day, and I heard he was very successful. How much did he leave? They said he left all of it. One guy said, if I can't take it, I ain't going, but he did. See, fellow said, well, you ought to send your money on ahead. They don't need it there. Amen. The streets are made of gold there. Amen. You know where they need it? They need it on the mission field. That's, right. That's where they need it. We need it to just improve our buildings and try to reach more people for Christ. Amen. That's what we need it for, to add new buses and to, to, and to expand and reach people for Christ. That's what it's needed Amen. for needed to fix a parking lot and build a gymnasium for young people so that, I mean, if we had a gymnasium, that building could be used almost, it could be used seven days a week to reach people for Christ. It could, couldn't it? You think about it. You would have more teenagers and young couples coming in here than you could care for. I'm confident of that. So we need to put our money and our values, uh, I believe we need to invest them in the future for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the psalmist, when he realizes the problem, he acknowledges, he says, how could I be so blind? And when, uh, you know, when, when his eyes were opened in verse 17, he got his eyes open. He said, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I what was going on. Until then, he said, I was blind. He said, I was not only blind, he said, I was stupid. You see, look at verse 20 and 22. As a dream, when one awakens, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins, in my conscience. 
So foolish was I and ignorant, I was like a beast. I was dumb like an animal. So here is a man that, that is coming back and giving a testimony, and thank God he came back and he could give a testimony as to what happened to him. But he said, I'm glad that God showed me what was going on. If you look at verse 23, you'll notice his own future. Now he recognized what's valuable. Nevertheless, I am constant, continually with thee. You know that is important, isn't it? Amen. Isn't it important to you? If, I, if, if you had to make the choice between, and I don't think you have to, but if you had to make the choice between a material possession and fellowship with God, you'd be foolish to give up your fellowship with the Lord. Amen. See? You'd be foolish because you couldn't enjoy it. You say, oh, I could enjoy it. No, you couldn't. You'd have to get so stinking drunk that you thought you were having a good time. Because you couldn't, if you're a Christian, you couldn't enjoy it because your conscience would be gnawing you to death. So finally he said, hey, I don't need all of those things. I don't have all of those things. I don't want all of those things. He said, to be with you is better. That's what he says in verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. In verse 24, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. And you see, Christians, we're pilgrims traveling through. We're on our way to heaven. And it's wonderful that we have the Lord with us while we're journeying. We, we sh we're not foolish. We know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. And thank God that we have a hope and an assurance that transcends the grave and we can have our Lord's presence constantly. And you know the Apostle Paul, he preached at the Corinthian church. And you know that the Apostle Paul wouldn't even take an offering while he was there. He wouldn't receive the offering. Because they were so carnal. A Corinthian church was so carnal and had criticized Paul so much that when they tried to pay him for services rendered, he wouldn't take it. Now, he later apologized in 2 Corinthians. Remember that? He said, I robbed other churches to do you service, you Corinthians. Forgive me this wrong. But when he went there the first time, he wouldn't receive an offering because they were carnal and backslidden, and Paul wasn't about to let them criticize him more by saying, we made Paul rich. Because he knew that's what they'd say. They took a big offering and tried to give it to Paul, and he said, keep it. You're so carnal, I don't want it. Because you'll say, oh, we made Paul rich. Paul went on to say that in this matter, he said, lest I abuse my power in the gospel. Lest I abuse my power in the gospel. So he wasn't about to do anything or have anything that stood between him and his fellowship and relationship with the Lord. And in verse 24, he's very confident of God's uh, protection, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterwards receive me into glory. And I can tell you one thing, Christian, that you can trust God, you can depend on God, you can walk with God, and God will guide you. Now, if you can't trust Him, you know, you need to get back to Calvary. If you can't trust God for a loaf of bread or a tank of gas, how can you trust Him to get you off the ground in the rapture? And I think these other things that we're talking about perhaps are practical tests of what we profess to believe. I mean, I know, know, know of an elderly lady. I guess she's elderly. I'm getting to where I can't talk about elderly people anymore. <laughs> I mean, when 70 and 80 year olds start looking good, you know, you're, you're it's dangerous. But... Uh, this dear old lady in one town, they always made fun of her because she is a little bit Pentecostal in her actions. She prayed loud. She shouted. She clapped her hands. And she bothered folks. So one night she was praying, and she's very poor but very happy. And she was praying for a loaf of bread, needed some bread. And she was praying, praying out loud, and some mean boys in the neighborhood heard her praying. 
So they went down to their house and got a loaf of this wonder bread. And they crawled up on the top of the house, and while she's praying, they drop this loaf of bread down the chimney. This loaf of bread goes down the chimney, hits the logs, rolls out in the floor, and bumps her knee where she's kneeling. Now, I said she was almost Pentecostal. When she looked down and saw that loaf of bread rolling up and bumping her knee, I mean, she did everything but speak in tongues. And while she's in there rejoicing, a tapping comes on the door. She went to the door, and the first thing she did was grab these guys and hug them. You know, and they don't know what's going on. And they finally settled down and said, Look, lady, don't be so foolish. We played a trick on you. We went up there, and we dropped this loaf of bread down to, make, to tease you. And she grabbed them and hugged them again and said, Glory to God, the de the, he used the devil to answer my prayers. See, it's all a matter of perspective. What do you care where it comes from? Because God is going to take care of you, and God is going to protect you, even if he has to use the wicked to do it. Amen. But he has a way of taking care of his people. Amen. God won't be your debtor. That's right. He will not be a debtor to you. You can trust him. And if you can trust him to save your soul, I guess you could trust him to take care of you. I wouldn't do it, but it wouldn't be because of fear, but I would have complete confidence if I ask anyone tonight, are you sorry that you have sold out for the Lord and surrendered to God and you give to God sacrificially? I, I would not, I don't believe that I'd have anybody to come and say, I'm sorry that I've been doing for God what I've been doing. I think the average Christian would say, I wish I could do more. I think that's the attitude of most Christians. I wish I could do more, you see. God's provision is in verse 26. Look at the text. I like verse 25 before you turn there. This is such a wonderful verse. Look at it carefully. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Seems like there's a song about that. That's it. Yeah. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Who upon earth that I desire beside thee? Boy, that's a good verse to memorize. And look, you know how he came to that conclusion in this verse? You know, you know how that this man got to the state to where he was able to realize how wonderful God was? He got to a place to where he began to see how foolish the world is and how foolish he was for envying the world. And he said, that's so foolish. He said, I don't have anybody in heaven but you, and there is none on this earth that I desire besides thee. Well, that's got to please God. And then verse 26, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. For lo, they that are far off from thee shall perish. Thou shalt destroy all them that go a-whoring from thee. So he's very confident that God is going to provide. And then in verse 27, he talks about the consequences of a godless life. And in verse 28, the, the confidence of a godly life. Look at verse 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. I put my trust in him. I have put my trust in him. Have you? I hope you will. You say, oh yeah, preacher, I'm trusting him to take me to heaven. Would you put your trust in him to take care of you on your way to heaven? Amen. Would you live by faith? Would you step out by faith and say, God, I want to invest in the future. I want to be a part of what's going on. I want to be a part of your ministry. And you can talk about me all you want to and think what you want to. But see this group of young people over here? That's because somebody gave. How many did you have down there today? 99. 99. 99. Why didn't you go get the hundredth one? <laughs> okay, 99. You know why they had 99 teenagers down there? Because somebody 
gives and works and prays. How many did you guys have on the buses total? Okay, a couple of hundred. Okay, all right. That's how I get the big numbers. You just, anyway, it's called somebody gave. Yeah, amen. It's called somebody gave. We need to keep our eyes on the Savior, get our eyes off of people who appear, appear. Everybody's got more than some of us have. Everybody. You will always find somebody that's got more than you. I don't care where you look. You will always find somebody that's got more. You will always find somebody that's got less. It makes no difference either way. The thing to do and be is be what God would have you to be and do what God would have you to do. Nobody told our brother to give 30%, I guess, except the Holy Spirit. I sure never told him. This is a conclusion he came to on his own. And so as we move forward, I hope that God, the Holy Spirit, can speak to our hearts and that we can do a... I, you know, I have no doubt about what God can do and wants to do. And so let's move forward. We can do more for people. We can reach more people for Christ. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you this evening for your love to us. Many down through the years have, in this church, may have gotten their eyes off of you and got more important, got more excited about making money and being prosperous and financially successful and trying to get folks saved and helping missionaries and reaching young people for Christ. May that not happen to us. Help us to stay in the Word. Help us to stay close to godly people. Rebuke us, I pray, and convict us when we have a tendency to lean in that direction. Help us not to be so foolish as to put any value of security in these things because we know that security is with you. And thank you for taking care of us and providing for us. Thank you for blessing this church the way you have. Thank you for the two men that were saved today. And I pray for this young man and young lady who raised their hand for prayer. I pray they'll get saved this week. And I pray you'll bless this invitation. Maybe someone tonight needs to join this church. They need to get in the harness and get busy for God. Perhaps there are those that need to get baptized. They are saved. They've never been baptized since they became a Christian. There may be those that are standing on slippery ground. Their feet are well nigh slipped, as the psalmist said. They need to get back to you. You know our hearts better than we do. I pray you'll shine the spotlight in those areas that need to be dealt with. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. What are we singing, brother? Number 310. Number 310. If you need to come tonight for any reason to be saved, to join this church, get baptized, or surrender your life to God, would you come on the very first stanza? Let him have his way. Come on, right now. Come on. All to Jesus I surrender. All Amen. to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. His presence may he live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Keep singing, keep praying. Come on. All to Jesus, I surrender. All forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Well, Kelly, uh, dismiss us in prayer, brother. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the message tonight. Lord, I thank you for speaking to my heart and helping me to realize how many times you have been there. Every time I've ever stepped out on faith, Lord, you've been there to carry me. 
Lord, I pray you'll forgive me for my lack of faith that I have, the lack of ability to trust you. God, you've never failed. Lord, we know that every time we step out, Lord, you're going to be there. God, I thank you for that truth. And Lord, I pray you would challenge our hearts to step out on faith, that next year we can look back and say, this is how God blessed. This is how you provided, Lord. So many times we deny you the opportunity to bless our lives and to, to use us. And God, I pray that you'll do it this year. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be sure and get your tickets now tonight. They'll be at the foyer or downstairs. Good night. God bless you. Shake hands with some folks. That was the problem. Uh, about uh, probably eight or ten years ago, I was at a um, uh, crew, um, basic youth conference, uh, and I finally committed my life to the Lord to whatever He wanted me to do. I was always afraid to uh, let Him have everything. I always kept enough back for me, so just in case there was something I didn't want to do, I hadn't committed that. And I, I was always afraid that uh, God would have me going back to Bible college and being a, a pastor, and, and so I wasn't going to give up to do that. So about uh, eight or ten years ago, I did that. Two years ago, during the Satara Crusades, I committed my life to being a missionary, you know, at whatever time in the future. Six months ago, that turned into China. Uh, not too long ago, that turned into a Boeing China. And it's uh, just been progressing since then. It looks like uh, the first week in March, it's getting fairly certain it's not tied up in a neat package yet, but it looks like that's when we'll be in China. But what I really wanted to say was that uh, Leslie made a comment that she had to go to my mother. Here, I'd been a Christian since I was 10 years old. And uh, that's why I say it was a Christian church. It was a Christian church enough that they had somebody come in to present the gospel. Uh, they did each Sunday, kind of. But it wasn't enough that you really knew what was going on. She heard those words, but she didn't have any explanation behind it. And uh, the, the thing that was missing was uh, what's in Ephesians 6.15 says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I just thought about this this morning in Sunday school. And that was what was missing in our church is we didn't have the preparation for the gospel. And uh, that is why I appreciate this church because uh, I'm embarrassed. That's one of my life embarrassments, one of those things in your past you don't want anybody to dig up. But I always was sort of under the impression that you didn't try to get somebody saved, they had to come to that on their own. So, you know, we would talk about things, but I wasn't, I'd never pushed, I never did anything. And uh, I'll tell you, I wouldn't give two cents for any church that not only doesn't teach you how to be saved, but doesn't ha that doesn't teach you how to tell somebody else to get saved. And uh, I, I wouldn't be any place else. So I'm excited to be saved. I'm excited that in spite of myself that uh, my wife is saved. So that's my story. <laughs> you folks be praying for the Jacobs. They'll be leaving, as he said, in just a few months and going to China. And uh, I mean, they had planned to go before Boeing ever, before he knew anything about what Boeing was going to do. And that's the miracle of it. You know, the Apostle Paul got a free trip to Rome one time by the 
by the Roman government. And uh, he was a missionary and won people to Christ all along the way. Matter of fact, he got shipwrecked on an island, if that's any consolation. <laughs> but, uh, but when I heard that Boeing was doing this for you, I just thought, you know, now that, is, that is the way God works. It's just uh, it's wonderful the way God does that. If you have your Bible again, let's just look at uh, a final passage here before we pray. Uh, would you take your Bible and turn to Romans 10, Romans chapter 10, and uh, if someone by you doesn't have a Bible, maybe you could let them look on with you. <coughs> In Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, look carefully at what Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be what? Saved. Obviously they were not saved. They were unsaved. And Paul's desire and his prayer for the nation of Israel was that they might be saved. Now here is a man who had a burden for his people. Notice this. I bear them record, verse 2. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Now, you heard the lady talk about doing the setups in the bed and all kinds of stuff, trying to get God's favor. That's zeal for God. Martin Luther, before he got saved, a Roman Catholic monk, he was going up the steps, kissing the steps, walking on his knees, doing penance to please God. Well, there's nobody here as religious as Martin Luther was. You're not that religious. You see those folks in the Philippines trying to appease God? Some of those Filipinos over there, they, they actually allow themselves to be nailed to a cross. Mrs. Delavino, you, you know that. She's from the Philippines. I was there on a holy day in the Philippines. I mean, everybody in the, in the islands came to Manila to worship Mary, and they would carry life-size statues of Mary. These people would dress in white gowns and whip themselves and march toward the sea. You know why folks are doing all that? They're trying to earn God's favor and God's approval. You see? Now look what it says, verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, that's Jesus Christ, and going about to establish their own righteousness. Now, if you're ever going to get saved, you're going to have to stop trying to establish your own righteousness. You're going to have to stop that, and you're going to have to accept Jesus Christ, who is God's righteousness. Now, look down at verse 9. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, and that's not to a priest, if thou shalt confess to thy, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. What? Thou not might be, not may be, it shall be. Thou shalt be saved. Look at verse 10. For with the heart, see that's where it starts. For with the heart a man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now you heard Leslie say, I believed everything. I understood what she meant. But you see, the devil believes it too. You don't believe anything the devil doesn't believe. He knows that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. He knows that Jesus died on the cross. He knows that Jesus Christ is God. But the devil's not saved. See? Every Roman Catholic believes what you believe. There's just one thing. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you see? Now, the answer is in verse 13. He explains exactly what that means in case you're confused about it. Look at verse 13. For whosoever shall what? Call upon the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. Now, Dean Wallace had been coming here for some months. He was under conviction. The only thing that's different about Dean today, uh, about that day, he didn't start believing anything that he didn't believe before. He just called. He trusted Christ as his Savior. He called upon him. The thief on the cross, remember him? He said, Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He got saved, called with his mouth. Saved. Simon Peter, when he began to sink, remember what he said? Lord, save me. 
Jesus reached down his hand and saved him. See? Now, <clears throat> there's some folks here tonight. I have no doubt that you believe in your heart that you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and that he arose and that he lives. But until you personally accept him with your mouth into your heart, you are not saved. See? From the heart with the mouth, you receive Christ. See? The way I got saved, 17-year-old boy. And, and I, I didn't know I wasn't saved because I always believed in God. And I went forward in a service, and a man sh told me this. He said, Ken, if you're just willing to receive Jesus as your Savior, he'll save you. And uh, he helped me pray. I'm kind of an emotional kind of person, and he helped me through a prayer. But my prayer was something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus died in my place. And right now I accept him as my Savior. Come into my heart and save me. And I meant that prayer. See? Now it's not the prayer formula. There's, you, can't say, you can't say a prayer in a particular way because then that turns into works. I mean, if you're drowning, you think the lifeguard's going to say, you didn't ask just right? <laughs> you, you think so? God is not holding out here and saying, no, you didn't say it right. Say it again. It doesn't work that way. So if you're not careful, we'll even make this prayer a matter of works. Say, So I, wanna, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. You believe in your heart, and you call upon him with your mouth, he'll save you. He says he will. He can't lie. You understand me? He cannot lie. Okay. So let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you this evening for what we've heard, the good music, for the testimonies, and I, I think it's going to be wonderful, or it would be wonderful in eternity if um, we could just hear people from all over the world throughout the ages tell about how they got saved. And Father, maybe there's someone here tonight that's not sure that if they died, they'd go to heaven. They're just not sure Jesus is their personal Savior. I pray for them. You are not the author of confusion. You are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I pray that uh, you'll visit with us this evening, and may folks be saved. Uh, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this evening, would you, uh, if you know for sure that you're saved, if you're one of those who say, Pastor, I have a clear testimony, I know I'm saved, if I died, I know I'd go to heaven, would you just slip your hand up for just a moment? Yeah, well, amen, thank you. You can just keep your head bowed, you can put your hand down. <laughs> I wonder if there's someone here say, Pastor Blue, I really don't know for sure that I'm saved, but I'd like to. Could I see your hand so I could pray for you? Is there one like that? God bless you, sir, and you, and you, and you. Is there someone else? Anyone else? Say, Pastor, I'm just not sure I'm saved. Okay, thank you. You can put your hand down. Several people have raised their hand tonight. I believe they are totally sincere. I have no doubt about it. But we don't get saved by being sincere. We get saved by receiving a person. And we have to do it sincerely. And so, Father, I pray that this young man on my right and these young ladies, I pray that you'll let nothing stop them from coming to trust the Savior. You've done all you can do for them. You died on the cross. You went to the grave. You conquered the grave. You arose. You defeated death in the grave, and you are alive forevermore, and you extend to them freely the gift of eternal life. You said, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so I pray that uh, they'll have clear understanding of what it means to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Have your way in our hearts now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now you heard folks tonight, those of you that raised your hand over here, and the rest of you, you heard just a few people. This was not staged. No one had any idea that we were going to do this tonight. But you heard just a few people come and say, here's how God dealt with me, and here's how I got saved. Everybody that's saved has a story similar to that. And you could move from this church to the next church where people are truly saved, and you'd hear it again. 
and again and again, just from one church to the next where people are truly saved, you'd hear this same story. Here's what happened. Here's how I got saved. That's what we call a testimony. The Apostle Paul repeatedly told about how he got saved. I've had folks to say to me, I wish I had a story that I could tell about how I got saved. Once you get saved, you've got a story. Once you get saved, you got one. So let's stand together. And uh, if you raised your hand tonight, or you didn't, and you should have, and you'd like to trust Christ as your Savior, I'm just going to be standing right over here by the communion table. I want you to step out from where you are. Just come over here and meet me. And I'll have a soul winner. If you're a lady, I'll have a lady to go with you and, and show you how to be saved. And uh, nobody will embarrass you. Nobody's going to try to talk you into joining the church. That's not the point. If you're a man, I'll have a man to pray with you. Make sure you're saved tonight. And you can leave this place knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Would you do that? All right, what are we singing, brother? Number 288. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson blood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay, and you are fully blessed. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. All right, you can be seated. Well, we praise the Lord for these who responded without hesitation. They already obviously had their mind made up. They needed to trust Christ as Savior. And that's because somebody was watering, and somebody is sowing, and God is giving the increase. Amen. And Christian, don't 
don't feel like you're a failure if you can't get somebody to say a prayer with you. You know, uh, you got to understand that there's three parts to this matter of getting people saved. There's the sowing, and there's the watering, and there's the reaping. Some of us, we just want to be reapers all the time, and we wind up many times forcing people to make decisions that they're not ready to make. And uh, so you just need to be getting gospel tracts out, giving your testimony at work, letting people see Christ in your life, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and God will bring people into your path. I believe if God can find a committed soul winner, there'll be a, sin a, con a, a convicted sinner somewhere, and he'll bring them together. He brings them together. And so thank God for that. Now, uh, these gentlemen are all standing around like the mafia with plates, offering plates, and I'm glad they're here. They're the right kind of mafia for, as far as I'm concerned. Folks, listen. Giving is just as spiritual as soul winning. You wouldn't have a church if somebody didn't give. Uh, Brother Don, go over, would you, to the light switch? And just hit as many of those switches if you, as you want to. Just be sure and find them when you come get them back on. I want to illustrate something to you. Just go ahead. You can't even find the switches now. That's, I think that's all of them. Yes, okay. The others are outside. Well, it'd be kind of tough to come to church and sit in the dark, wouldn't it? Thank you. You can turn them on. Because you give, we're able to have light. If you didn't give, there wouldn't be any lights in this building. If you didn't give, there wouldn't be any warmth. There wouldn't be any heat. If you didn't give, you wouldn't have these comfortable pews to sleep in or to sit in. <laughs> if you didn't give, you wouldn't have a songbook there in front of you. These cost about six dollars, six to eight dollars a piece. I think that's our price. I'm not sure. About six or eight bucks. You wouldn't have a songbook if somebody didn't give. In many of these pews, there's a Bible right in the front of that to help people who come. If you didn't give, there wouldn't be a Bible there. Your kids are in the nursery. If you didn't give, there wouldn't be a nursery. You heard, uh, you heard this young man right here say, I got saved, because I think, on the bus ministry. You, you came on the bus ministry, isn't that right? Yeah. Don't you? I think they had about six or eight buses when you started coming or something like that. But if somebody didn't give, there wouldn't be a bus ministry. Couldn't be any buses. We, pay, we buy gas. We pay for gas just what you pay. We don't get, an, we don't get a discount on gasoline. Uh, I, we need two tires for the buses. That's a couple of the Christmas gifts out there we're asking folks for. We need two tires. They're $85 a piece. We have to pay it or we have to park the buses. We have to pay for insurance just like you do. No, no difference. No break. The, the only good thing around here is that Dick Kimball is a, is a born-again mechanic, and if we didn't have a good saved mechanic, we couldn't keep these buses running. Same. Now, that all takes <laughs> just cold currency. It just takes money. It takes money. I wish we could run this thing without money, but uh, we sure can't. Say It's impossible. So I want you to kind of, again, we need to quit dissecting our Christian life and think, Here's Bible study, and here's prayer, and here's soul winning. But giving is something else, you see. And we may or may not get around to that. It's a whole package. A whole package. The Christian life is a stewardship, the whole thing. Now, this fellow right here got saved on the 4th. Don't you manage this store down below under the hill here? See? Okay. We pay the same as he pays for electricity. Same thing. They have to have customers or they have to close the doors. God's people have to give, or we have to close the doors. It's, it's, it's that simple. It's that simple. So we don't give to merit God's grace. We don't give to get saved. We give because we are saved, and we give because we want to see other people saved. See, that's the point. We give because we want to see other people. The Jacob's going to the mission field. Brother Reese is uh, on, uh, doing mission work, and uh, uh, all of our missionaries, they'd have to come home if churches didn't give. They couldn't go. 
it's impossible. And uh, so it's just uh, it's a it's a vital thing, and uh, it is very spiritual. It's not the business end of the work of the ministry. It is a spiritual thing. And so I'm going to ask our men to come as you think about what you should do for God tonight. <clears throat> Brother Colby, lead us in prayer, please. God bless you now as you give. I uh, just wanted to confirm something with Brother Kelly here. Uh, I think a few people are under the impression that uh, there's no Sunday school next Sunday. And uh, I don't know where that ever got started, but uh, we are having Sunday school. You know, it's a religious holiday, so we, we really are going to teach the Word of God and teach about Christmas, you know, and the virgin birth. And, and a good place to do that is in Sunday school. So. If uh, you have heard that there's not going to be a Sunday school, you did not hear it through the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? So uh, that's probably wishful thinking on somebody's part, perhaps. But anyway, there will be a Sunday school for every class, so every teacher needs to be here and cover, make sure that they're prayed up and ready to teach your lesson because there will be some people here. And uh, if there's only one person beside you, that might be just the right person. You ought to read about D.L. Moody getting saved sometime, you know. Just one person, you know. And uh, so you have no idea what God has in mind for that one student or those students that are going to be in your class next Sunday. Now, in the 11 o'clock hour, we're going to have some special things, of course. And then next Sunday night, uh, we're going to have some Christmas presents up here that you folks have bought for the church. We're going to spend a little time opening those and, and just kind of having a family time together and fellowshipping. So uh, you'll be out of here early next Sunday night, but uh, nothing changes, okay? In fact, uh, Mrs. Stillman told me, she said, we're going to have our family over Christmas. We're going to bring them all to church Sunday. That's the right thing to do. I mean, rather than you letting people keep you home, you ought to bring them to church. And if they won't come with you, just lock them outside and say, when I get back, I'll let you in, you know. You know? But uh, you ought to be in church on Sunday, amen? 
And I want to commend, uh, Laura, I want to commend you for the good job you did. You and, you and your folks did a tremendous job. Thank you. All right. Kelly, anything you need to say here, brother? Well, just come and dismiss us in prayer. Then. Okay. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here tonight. Lord, we've each been so blessed. Lord, we're privileged to see your power and how you continue to work through the lives of men and women. Lord, how you continue to work through this church and the people who have planted seeds and watered, and Lord, you just continue to give the increase. Lord, you could use music to reach people's hearts. And Lord, the people that labor so hard to make that music glorify you the best of their ability, and Lord, that you use it to see people saved. Lord, you use the testimonies of just us, the, the, the members of this church, of what you've done to break down to the hearts of each person. And Lord, for the many, that, the, the, the ones that were saved today, God, I just thank you for it. Lord, eternity will be changed, no doubt, as a result of the services held at this, this church today. We couldn't tell how many people will be saved in the future because of it, but Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came, that he died, that he rose again, and that he offers salvation free to every, everyone who would believe. And God, I just pray that this holiday time, that we would not put it aside. Lord, that um, we would not forsake what you have for us to do, Lord, to spread the gospel. I pray that each of us would go back this week and look and see how can we somehow use this holiday to see people saved. Lord, I pray that you bring us back next Sunday, Lord, expecting to see people to trust you. And Lord, I just pray that you'd use us this week. We thank you for it so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. By the way, excuse me, brother. Is there a work party tomorrow night, Larry? Okay. How many of you men? What? You've got a long list, so he needs a lot of men. How many of you men can be here tomorrow night to help Brother uh, Hogarth? Hold your hand up. There's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, at least five, Brother Larry. All right. Shake hands with folks. Uh, I think they've got some Costco cake downstairs. Keep saying yes to the Lord. Others still responding. Just go to your knees. Don't let anybody talk to you. Just settle it with God. Surrender all the rights of your life to Him right now. Any others? Feel free. Join those that are there. You say, oh, but I'm just too proud to go. You said it right. You said it right. And when your desire to be right with God exceeds your pride, that's when there'll be spiritual victory. Amen. That's what it's going to take. Others, feel free. Join those that are going. If you're here tonight and you're not even sure you've ever opened your heart to receive Christ, you're, you're lost. If you were to lay your head in the pillow of death right now, you'd be in eternal damnation. Let me just remind you, you are one heartbeat away from everything the Bible calls eternal hell. Just one heartbeat away. And that heartbeat can stop any time. And it happens to young people as well as old. It happens to healthy people as well as ill people. It's one heartbeat. And every day you fail to repent and meet God is one more day to repent of and one less day to repent in. That's why the Bible says now is the accepted time. The only thing you're promised is now. No promise for the future. Not even 10 minutes from now. And if God is speaking in your heart and you need to join those that are there, you can go to that place of prayer and pray the sinner's prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Save me for Christ's sake. Fill my heart with your love and your life, your glory. Cleanse me from all my sins. Purify my life. I'm tired of living my own life. Just let him do it. Anyone else who needs to go to the place of prayer, here's your opportunity. God has spoken to you. Respond to him. Now let's pray for those that have responded. Lord, I praise thee and I thank thee for who thou art, for what thou art doing, what thou art saying. Just keep on being the Lord of these days. We just love thee, we worship thee, we adore thee. We praise thy name for being God and for revealing thyself to us even tonight. Have thy way. We'll give thee all the praise and the glory. We thank thee for it. Christ's name we ask it. For his sake. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Would you, uh, what's that? Sister oh, sister's coming to share. That's fine. I was going to say, would you forgive us if we dismissed at, 10 30, at 935? No, come ahead. No, Lou says no. Other folks need to share. Oh, this is my third time up here, and it's not getting any easier. <clears throat> but you know, well, I think what I would recommend is that you start doing what Tom's doing. <laughs> Maybe just I'm stand up to. here. That's right. Okay. But um, I just have something that's it's such a joy to my soul that I need to share it. Uh, I already shared with you the other two victories that the Lord gave me in my life, one over bitterness and one over uh, trying to be the Lord of our marriage. And the Lord did give me victory in those two areas. And uh, for several years, ever since I've been saved, I've been saved about 10 years. And I've not had any problem with my salvation. I, I've had the assurance I know I'm saved. But I always felt like there was something missing in my life. And sometimes when pastor would be up preaching and he'd say, you know, I just love to read my Bible. I can't get enough of it. And I, I would always say to myself, well, I don't, I don't feel that way. I, I don't care if I ever pick up my Bible and read it. And if I ever did, I, I would just force myself to do it. I didn't get any joy from reading it. And it wasn't until this revival that I realized what was really wrong in my life. And it was the fact that I had never asked God and really meant it. <laughs> I can't even put it into words. This is hard. To come into my soul and be the Lord of my life and to let me really know him, to have an intimate relationship with him, to really feel like I could tell him that I loved him and that I meant it. I've never been able to do that. I, I've always appreciated everything he's done for me, my salvation, and answer to prayer and things. But three nights ago I prayed and I really got myself out of the way and I said, Lord, I want this more than anything in my life. I want to have the joy and the peace deep down in my heart that comes from knowing you in an intimate way. And the Lord answered my prayer that night. I woke up in the morning. I had the joy of the Lord in my soul. There's no doubt about it. Amen. I listened to a Christian tape that I listened to many times before that was pretty music, but it didn't mean anything to me. And I listened to those songs again, and those words were so wonderful. They just, Amen. I can't explain it. And I read, um, Pastor Blue gave us a book for Christmas called In Pursuit of God. Well, I never wanted to pick it up. I said I didn't enjoy reading the Bible. That went for all religious, I mean Christian material. I, I love to read, but I'd read anything before I'd read Christian material or the Bible. And I picked that book up, and I started reading it. And I was saying, Lord, yes, that's so true. That is so true. And the prayers at the end of each chapter, I prayed. I made those my very own prayers. And I just can't describe the joy and the peace that I have in my soul that I've, I've missed ever since I've been saved. And I just thank the Lord for it. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful. When you get finished with the pursuit of God, then you'll get the book on the table, The Knowledge of the Holy. Same author classic on the character of God. Come in. Well, I gave my testimony last week sometime 
about I was at the point that I almost hated my daughter. And today we spent the whole day together and it was wonderful. Amen. That I went to her and I apologized for trying to play God. And she came to me and asked me to forgive her. And, and there has been a war in our house. And uh, it's gone. Amen. And it's wonderful. And last night she was here. And uh, she went to talk to Kathy. And I'd asked somebody if she was here, because I couldn't find her. And they said, well, she, she booked home. And I thought, oh, good. So I went home to see her, make sure she was there. She wasn't there. I'm sitting here, God. And I went next door, because I figured that's where she's at. And I knocked on their door. And this is at 12 o'clock. And I'm sitting here going, I don't know what I'm going to do. God, I gave her to you. I don't want her back. I mean, I don't want to pick her up and make her my burden again. She's yours. And whatever you do is fine with me. And I sat there. And my neighbor said, oh, are we going to hear fireworks tonight? And I said, no. And I just went home. And when she got home, I asked her where she was, because I couldn't find her. And she says, I walked home. And I said, OK. I says, but don't do it again. Let me know if you're leaving. And But we had a wonderful day today. We went to the mall and just spent like three hours going through stores and just being together. And it was wonderful. Amen. 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 Yes, the children will come in. See, that kind of a testimony seems to be such a little thing to some of you, but that's the working out. No kissing in church back there. <laughs> Praise the Lord, that wonderful. That's the practical working out of restoring of relationships that God alone is doing. Well, something else has happened in my life, so I wanted to share it. Um, the Lord has convicted me among many, many things of uh, not being the head of my household. And um, this has been uh, something that's been working, and I haven't contributed to it. It's been all the Lord's work. And uh, my daughter is in an institution and has been for quite some time. And she worked herself into a situation where she was demanding to get out, and they could not hold her. They would have to release her. And uh, my wife has always dealt with that. I've never uh, been involved in that part of our family. And uh, but my wife has been incapacitated, and so I had to deal with it. And I was able to talk to uh, Dr. Joan Mooring, who's been here, and dear Pastor Blue over the phone today, and got um, some counseling and such, and. Uh, uh, got some lessons in how to be the head of the household, and um, uh, we did some, took some stands and made some decisions, and uh, she finally realized that she didn't want to get out into the circumstances in which she would have to, to face life, face the consequences of her decision. And so, uh, you know, you could be calling, calling your bluff or whatever. I didn't do it. The Lord did it, and Pastor Blue uh, led me through.